Nick obviously is very instrumental in advising us on our woodland and, and meadow management uh, and really invaluable to us. Um, tonight he's going to be talking specifically about a reserve that he works on at the head of the Marden Valley, the Morgan's Hill. Um, and obviously we hope that you're all going to go away inspired and having learnt lots so that you can you can help us with our butterfly count next Saturday and uh, go home and, and, and improve habitat and help study butterflies and contribute to the national data collection. And there are so many ways to do that. And I'm sure Nick will expand on those. So over to you, Nick. Um, and thank you very much for coming this evening. OK, so thanks for that introduction, Nicky. And uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I hope everyone's not too hot. I'm absolutely melting here. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll get through another hour, I imagine. So OK, let's share the screen. Um, right, there we go. Can everybody see that okay? Yep. All right, okay, brilliant. Right, so, yeah, so last time um, there was a talk, it was by the guy from Reading uh, University and he talked about uh, invertebrates and pollinators and that type of things, and it was, it was really interesting. Um, so this time we're gonna concentrate on just one type of invertebrate. So we're gonna look at butterflies on a specific site um, and we, so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of have a bit of look at the site first, where it is, uh, you know, why is it so special, that type of thing. Then I'll look at a bit of butterfly ecology um, and then eventually I'll move on to some like specific butterflies that you can find on the reserve and I'll talk about them a bit. Um, and then, yeah, we'll then after that, we'll probably have a look at what you guys can do to help sort of conserve butterflies. Um, yeah, as long as I don't go off on a tangent, that's roughly what we're what we're going to be doing. So, so okay. So that's me. Two pictures, one pre and post beard. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, yeah. So I work for the Wiltshire Wildlife Trust. I've been a staff member for about seven years now, um, uh, and my job is Wild Landscapes Project Officer. So what I do. Uh, sort of day in day out is I work with people across the county um, we've got a small team and we help people to improve their green spaces for wildlife so we do a lot of um, meadow restoration creating meadows installing, installing wildlife ponds all sorts of things uh, but what we try and do is we take aspects of our work across our nature reserves out to the wider uh, sort of county and we work with private individuals, schools, um, organizations, everybody really. Uh, so, and it's mainly because, um, you know, in the past we've just worked on our sort of network of nature reserves, which are special places, but these days with climate change, um, you, you know, fossil fuels being burned, all that type of stuff, it's not enough now to just work on our reserves. What we need to do is work all across the county, work with everybody. And then that way we can increase the amount of habitat for wildlife uh, and make the whole county and the whole country a better place to live in. So that's my, that's my job. That's what I do day in, day out. But also uh, within the trust, I'm also the reserve warden at Morgan's Hill, which was one of our reserves that we bought in about 1980. And I've been the reserve warden there for probably, well, I think just over 10 years now. So quite a while. And um, what I do at Morgan Hill, I do it voluntarily. I don't get paid for doing it. It's just something that I've always done and it's just something that I love. So hopefully today I can sort of instill in you guys, you know, a little bit of what I do and the sort of passion for what I do and some of the beautiful things that live there and hopefully um, inspire some of you to come and help out wherever that might be and just you know make like i say make wiltshire a better place for everybody to live including the wildlife so yeah I, just while i think of it actually um if anybody wants to ask questions you can put a question in the chat box um whether i see it or not i don't know but if i do see it i'll try and answer it as we go along but i may not see it so it might have to wait till the end but if you want to chuck something in there yeah go ahead i'll, I'll, I'll do what i can Right, so let's just, uh, ooh, sorry. Right, okay, so Morgan's Hill, where is it? So if we're looking at the map here, 
it's let me get my little pointer there it is down in the bottom right hand corner it's just about here so if you look at the wider landscape in between these blue lines this is the Marden Valley uh Khan in the middle River Marden flowing from the Avon right down through Khan uh and the the where it's where the spring is is here Ranscombe Bottom just by Calston Wellington so that's where the Marden starts so Morgan's Hill is on the top of the hill overlooking the spring of the River Marden. So it's sort of like the um, one of those points right at the start and it overlooks the whole valley. If you think about this picture in the first slide, uh, that was looking basically over the Marden Valley. And so Nikki uh, mentioned about the connectivity of habitats. So Morgan's Hill is here at this end and then all, through, all the way through the corridor of the Marden Valley, there's different bits of habitat, including Hazelwood, Wood, which is right in the middle there. And that's actually also the place where I live. So I live at Studley, which is just here. So, and then the other site that Avon East Trees have just bought is at Stanley, which is somewhere around about here, I think. So that idea of connecting up uh, habitat throughout the Marden Valley is a really important one. Um, and, what it does is if, if you can connect up the bits of habitat, then it gives uh, the wildlife that live in the valley uh, a, a means to get from one place to another so that when populations expand, it's got places to go. So the idea of the River Marden Valley and its importance for, for wildlife, you know, it is really important. I think it's, um, I've spoken to Robert about this a, a couple of times. Uh, I think that in, we live in a country, England now, which pretty much all of the, um, the habitat in the country has been managed by people at one time or another. There isn't really any wild um, sort of land left anymore. Not like when you think of sort of, you know, wilderness in, in North America or something like that. And I think that these river valleys in between the small towns, you know, just the, not even big rivers, but, you know, small rivers like the River Marden, those are really now our wild areas. Those are our corridors with, you know, green space. Um, and, and, you know, it's got all the stuff in there. It's got, it's got woodland, it's got rivers, it's got uh, meadows. So though, it's really important that we conserve those types of places. So Morgan Hill itself is a, what we call a chalk grassland reserve. So it's all about the soil underneath these different places. And the Marne Valley is, is, quite interesting, well, I think it's quite interesting anyway, that it's got the three main different types of soil type uh, along its course. So Morgan's Hill is a chalk grassland reserve. So underneath uh, the grassland here, the, the geology is chalk. Um, then around, around, around the river area, we've got uh, the Avonvale clay, but we've also got this area of sandy soil, which sort of extends up through Bowwood from Chitto, that sort of area, uh, and extends right up to almost where Hazeland is. Uh, and that's quite unusual. Wiltshire doesn't really have much in the way of sandy soil or, or acidic soil. Um, there's a little bit down in the southeast corner of Wiltshire, and then the other area is this area around Chitto. So it does make the Marder Valley quite distinctive because there isn't really many other places within Wiltshire that has that range of different soil types and therefore um, a range of different uh, species and wildlife that lives there. So thinking about the reserve itself, it's a chalk grassland, it's what we call a triple SI, a site of special scientific interest. So it's, it's really special and it's special for the diversity of its wildflowers and butterflies. The reason, there's a couple of reasons why this is so. There's a couple of examples of some of the orchids that live on the reserve. This one here is called a um, marsh hellebrine, and it's it's a, a really special plant. As the name suggests, it should be found in sort of marshy areas, but actually um, at Morgan's Hill, it's not marshy at all. It's chalk, which is, uh, so water drains through it quite easily. For some strange reason, there must be some soil discrepancy or something like that, that actually means there's an area of clay up there but these marsh hellebrines um, do grow at Morgan's Hill. And that makes it 
I mean, that is like how that even happens. I don't know. It's just incredible. There's a, only about, I think, three places you can see this flower in Wiltshire and the other two are in marshy areas. And this, this marsh hellebrine um, on Morgan's Hill, the colony of, of hellebrines at Morgan's Hill is uh, the only downland site of uh, marsh hellebrine in the country. That's how special it is. So, and the reason it's special is because of the chalk underneath. So what it means is that it's very porous. So when water or any, uh, so rain uh, lands on the reserve, it basically drains straight through. And that what that means is that any nutrients are in, are in the ground, get drained through, and there's no nutrients in the soil. Now, if you, you might think that um, if you're thinking about growing stuff in your garden, you want nutrients in the ground because it makes your vegetables grow big and all that type of thing. But in, in a meadow situation, you actually want the opposite. What you want is no nutrients at all because the really nice wildflowers grow in areas where there's not much nutrients and they don't have to um, compete with nutrient loving plants like nettles and that type of thing. So the first thing that yeah makes the, the reserve special is the, uh, is the fact that it's chalk underneath. But there's also, um, it's, it's what we call agriculturally unimproved. So it's never had um, it's never had pesticides put on it, fertilizers, it's not been plowed. And the reason for that is because the hill itself is quite steep. And therefore, uh, across you know, the last several hundred years, even probably further, um, farmers have found it difficult to farm that land because it's just too steep. So these little areas um, get pretty much left. And then there, and that means that they don't get agriculturally improved and therefore they've got the nutrient um, free uh, conditions that are needed for all these lovely wildflowers. This one down in the corner is a um, pyramidal orchid. So there's, there's 13 different types of orchids, I think, on the reserve. It's, it's a really special place. And because there's that diversity of wildflowers, you then get a good diversity of butterflies. So we have to manage the reserve. It, you know, people think that in terms of grassland, you can just leave it and everything's fine. But that isn't actually the, it isn't actually the case. Because when you think about it, um, any piece of land within England anyway, if you leave it, eventually, if you leave it long enough, it will revert to woodland and probably something like oak woodland or ash woodland, something like that. So grassland is kept as grassland in one of two ways. Either you cut it or you graze it with some sort of livestock. If you don't, um, if, um, if somebody's got their microphone switched on, can they switch it off? Because it's quite off-putting to sort of be hearing people chatting. Is that okay, please? Okay, thanks. That's about it. All right, cheers. Uh, so yeah, so right. So yeah, so we so all grassland needs to be managed with either grazing or cutting. At Morgan's Hill, it's too steep to cut to get farm machinery onto it. So we have to manage reserve with grazing. Uh, and we use two different types of livestock. So we've got um, Dexter cattle, which is a, a sort of hardy native breed. I think they actually come from Ireland originally, but we'll call it native. Um, and they're, they're quite small. You can see in the picture, they're, they're not big cattle, but that makes them really good for grazing on a steep terrain that you find on the reserve. Um, and then in the winter, we graze with Herdwick sheep. And there's a Herdwick sheep down there in the right hand corner. They're really, uh, again, they're native breed. They come from the Lake District and they, they're a really characterful animal. Um, they're always escaping. They, um, they're quite intelligent. Um, and yeah, they, they, they never cease to sort of surprise me. But the reason we only use them in the winter is because if you graze with sheep in the summer, they actually, they graze in a different way to cattle. So they, 
they will eat the wildflowers and the orchids first because they like to go for the sort of nice juicy wildflowers they don't they'll eat grass if there's nothing else but if there's wildflowers about they'll eat them first so therefore we've got to leave them uh, off the reserve in summer and then they only graze in winter whereas with the with the dexter cattle um they they just basically grab lumps of anything at random so they'll, they'll grab grass but they will grab wildflowers in it as well but they're quite small animals and we only we only ever have in the summer we would only ever have about six on the reserve at one time so they don't end up destroying any in everything but we just have a small number just to keep on top of the grazing and make sure that the, the grass stays in the condition that we want it to but it's quite a complex business you know we have to keep moving them around taking them off at the right times if it gets too wet they have to come off again maybe put some back on so it's 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 quite difficult but it's the only other option would be to cut it and that's really difficult because we can't get machinery on there um so yeah that that's how we manage to reserve we also at times do various manual types of work with volunteer groups and that type of thing um maybe taking out ash saplings or taking out some vegetation that we don't want maybe stuff like um rag work if it gets too much generally speaking we leave it because it's a decent plant for wildlife really and the cattle don't eat it unless there's nothing else to eat so we generally don't worry too much about rag work but we do do some manual stuff as and when necessary so okay so let's let's move on to butterflies i'm going to talk a little bit about the life cycle now so everybody knows um the life cycle of a butterfly from uh, the adult, adult butterfly lays an egg, egg turns into caterpillar, caterpillar goes into pupa and eventually you get another adult again. That's fairly simple, but I just want you to think about really that it's not quite as simple as what you think. It, every butterfly is different. There, some of them will, as an adult butterfly, will only last maybe two weeks. So, when you think about it, although a butterfly's life cycle might be a year or slightly more than a year, it only spends perhaps two weeks, maybe a bit more as an adult butterfly. So actually that beautiful insect we see flying around is only a small part of the overall life cycle. And there's so much that goes on in terms of like where the eggs are laid, what plants they're laid on, the weather conditions at times, stuff like that and it just goes to show how precarious butterflies are some butterflies do overwinter some of the bigger ones like that peacock that's shown at the top there they will overwinter as an adult but most butterflies don't overwinter as an adult some will overwinter as, a, as an egg some as a caterpillar some even as a pupa and it's different in different types of butterflies and there's also a lot of different sort of ecological um what's the word, sort of interactions that go on. Some butterflies, and we'll come on to probably a couple of them later on, um, some of the blue butterflies, actually, when the, uh, the caterpillar is at an early stage, it will crawl into the, into the nest of certain species of ants. And over winter, though it, the, the caterpillar exudes this type of, um, not sure what the word is, sort of not a pheromone, more, more like a, um, a substance that the ants think is, uh, so the ants get confused and think it's one of their own larvae. And then that way they look after the larvae all the way through the winter. And then in the spring, the adult butterfly will emerge from the nest. And there's just these absolutely incredible ecological um, interactions that go on. And it just, it, you know, the, on the face of it, Butterflies seem quite simple, but when you delve into it a little bit, um, they're actually really complex. And because they're so complex, it means that there's um, they're a good indicator of the health of our environment because they're so where where it's it's such a delicate balance between these different stages of the life cycle. Um, anything untoward that happens at any any point in that cycle can really cause a difference in the number of butterflies that are that are uh, on the wing in any given year 
So if the butterfly numbers are really high, it generally means that conditions are good and things are going well. But if butterfly numbers are low, then it means that things are not going well and we really need to be looking at what's going on. Um, I know that goes for pretty much everything, but the, the, the butterfly numbers do fluctuate quite a lot year on year. But if you look at the figures, even though it does fluctuate a lot, since about the 1970s, butterflies in England as a whole have probably decreased by about 70 something percent, maybe even more, which is a massive decrease. And it just shows that actually this is not good and we really need to do something about it as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, the, we'll, we'll come on to a, a, a sort of conservation and that type of thing a bit later on. So, so butterflies can roughly be split into two, two different types, generalists and specialists. So, and that's usually based on what the food plan of a specific butterfly is. And when I say food plan, I mean what plan does uh, a butterfly lay its eggs on and then the, the larvae will use that as food as it's growing. So in the case of the comma, uh, which is on the left, the food plant is common nettle. So we call that a generalist butterfly because basically common nettles can be found all over the place in lots of different habitats. If you think about the Marden Valley, you can find um, nettles all the way throughout the valley and therefore you're likely to find commas all the way through the valley. So, so it's a generalist in, um, in terms of what habitat it will use and you'll even find it in gardens, parks, all that type of thing. Whereas, on the other hand, if you look at the specialist, as the, this is a chalk kill blue, the only food plant that the chalk kill blue will use is horseshoe vetch. So horseshoe vetch is basically only found on chalk hills such as Morgan's Hill and that sort of area. So you will only find chalk hill blue butterflies in areas where the horseshoe vetch is. And because that means it's you only, you know, the, the horseshoe vetch is only found on, um, on chalk, therefore the butterfly is only found on chalk. Um, so that's a specialist. You know, you won't find this butterfly in a, um, a neutral meadow or a woodland or anything like that because horse that's not where horseshoe vets grows so therefore you don't get the butterfly this chalk hill blue is also one of the one of the butterflies i referred to just now about um that the, it's larvae it goes down into an ant's nest and um it's looked after by the 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 ants throughout the winter it doesn't always do it there's certain species that always do that one of them is the large blue but the chalk hill blue can at times the larvae goes into the ants nest and the ants look after it. It's really incredible. Okay, so butterflies at Morgan's Hill as a whole. Across the UK, there's 59 species of butterfly. Um, 57 of those are resident and two of them are migrants. At Morgan's Hill, there's 37 species of butterfly that have been recorded, um, or that's what I got the, the information from the Biological Record Centre, there was 37 uh, recorded there and that's over probably like the last 30 or 40 years um, but there was actually 39 but two of them I'm fairly sure are incorrectly recorded so there was one record of a large heath um, which we do get a butterfly called small heath at Morgan's Hill but we don't get large heath because as as the name suggests they're usually found on heathland damp heathland stuff much further up north so I'm pretty sure that the large heath, what is a small heath, but it's just been recorded with the, with the incorrect name. And also with a large wall, there's a butterfly called a wall, but the large wall is extremely rare in Britain. Um, it has been seen maybe, you know, a handful of times. As far as I'm aware, it's never been seen at Morgan's Hill. So I think that one is uh, misrecorded as well. So yeah, I think it's, it, basically 37 species. And for, for one individual site, um, 37 species is a lot. You probably won't find any other site in the country that has more. There might be a few, a handful, but basically 37 is, is as much as you're gonna get on one site. And that's mainly because if you think back to the, to the um, 
to the generalist and the specialist, um, a lot of butterflies are specialists, so you can only find them in certain places. Some of them, such as a mountain ringlet, are only found in the Scottish Highlands. So obviously you're not going to find it in Morgan's Hill. So, you know, that's, um, it's just the way that it is. You know, there isn't one site in this country where you can find all 59 types of butterflies. So actually, in terms of sites across the country, Morgan's Hill is one of the most diverse in terms of butterflies. So, okay, so let's look at a few of the species in a bit more detail then. We're not going to go through all 37 uh, because we'd still be here tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to go through about six, I think. Uh, we're going to have a look at each and, and go through them, talk a little bit about them and um, see where we get to. Okay, so this is the first one, the grizzled skipper. So the, there's a bunch of uh, butterflies in the skipper family um, and they all pretty much look like a moth. Um, so they, they're what we term, um, is they're sort of like, what's the word? Um, I'm not even really sure now, but they, there's, there isn't really any difference between moths and butterflies. Uh, they're all pretty much the same thing. Um, you, can, you can sort of try and think of it in a way of like, most, most moths fly at night, um, but then there are some moths that fly in the day. Uh, you'd think maybe that butterflies are uh, really colourful, but not all butterflies are really colourful, and some but some moths are really colourful too. So there isn't really any way that uh, by eye you can tell the difference between a moth and a butterfly. What it comes down to is some really technical stuff about wing configuration and that type of thing. Um, but the the skippers uh, do look fairly moth-like. Um, I think, I don't know, I think the grizzled skipper looks quite nice, actually. It's got this sort of, like, yeah, checkered pattern to it. Um, it's a lovely little butterfly. It's not very big. And that's uh, the picture you're seeing on the screen now is, you know, it's, it's way bigger than what it actually is in real life. It's probably only about, I don't know, 40 mil wide, something like that. They're only small. Um, but they're, a, they're what we call a spring butterfly. We find them in May, June. And they use food plants such as um, agrimony and salad burnet, which you can see at the bottom down there. So occasionally, this is one of the butterflies that sometimes has a second brood. So most butterflies will have that life cycle, like I showed you before, where you've got the adult butterfly laying an egg. Um, and then that turns into caterpillar, caterpillar into pupae, and then back to the adult again. Um, and generally speaking, that happens once in a year. But there are certain butterflies which can have more than one brood in a year. So, the, and the grizzle skipper is one of them. Some it doesn't always have two broods, but sometimes in a good year, if the conditions are good, uh, it will have a second brood. So there'll be uh, adult butterflies on the wing around about May, but then again in August we might see some more. It doesn't always happen, and it needs good conditions. I'm wondering whether this year we might actually see a few in August. Now that we've got some really nice weather um, and we didn't so much in May, wondering if we might end up with a second batch this year, but we'll see. So the grizzled skipper was, when I first became warden about 10 years ago, um, I didn't see a grizzled skipper for, I don't know, a good few years. And I thought to start off with that, it was probably extinct at Morgan's Hill. Um, but then one year, um, out of the blue, you see this, this picture on the left was uh, taken by somebody called Darcy Gindral. And then one year, she posted a site in that she'd seen a, um, a, a grizzled skipper at, at Morgan's. So, uh, you know, I was really excited by that because I actually, I thought I didn't think they were there anymore. And slowly over the course of the following years, um, they grew in number and now we've got a fairly healthy population. There's not huge numbers of them, but I see, I regularly see them every year now. So I sort of consider it as a bit of a, bit of a success. Um, it would be better if there was more, but there's certainly more than when I first started as warden. So they're going, they're heading in the right direction at Morgan's Hill anyway. So yeah, it's, it's a minor success, I think. So the next butterfly is the wall. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting butterfly because 
technically it's, or it was, a generalist. If you go back to the 70s, um, it was a quite numerous butterfly pretty much all the way across the country. Um, I don't remember it as a child because I was only born in 1974, but people that, uh, that I have talked to have talked about uh, walls being seen in gardens and pretty much all over the place as you would, um, you know, small tortoise shells or peacocks these days. Um, they're called wall, by the way, because they, they've got a habit of landing on walls or bare areas. Uh, that's what they like, you know, places that are sort of stone, that type of thing. And they, and they, they land on those areas and it helps them to warm up. Um, so at Morgan's Hill, as in the picture up here, they like to land on the bare patches of chalk um, and they sit there for a while warming up and um, uh, they seem to like that. And that's where they get their name from. I think it's quite, quite cool, really. But yeah, so they, back in the 70s, they were quite um, numerous across the country, but since then they've declined massively. And now they're quite restricted to these sort of like uh, sites, mainly around the coast, which have lots of bare stone uh, and rocky areas. But there are some inland um, colonies and Morgan Seal is actually a stronghold for this butterfly, especially within Wiltshire. So there's probably not many other places where you can see so many walls um, as at Morgan's Hill. So technically, originally, it was a generalist because it, its food plants are Coxfoot and Yorkshire fog, which are grasses, and they can be found all over the place. Um, they use other grasses as well. So it's, they're, not, they're not a specialist because of the food plant, but they've more become a specialist because of the way that they declined um, since the 70s. So yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a sad story for the wall. Um, but we're doing what we can for it in Morgan's Hill. And like I say, Morgan's Hill is a stronghold. Uh, there's a lot of them seen there. And this is one of the butterfly that can have three or in a really special year, even four broods. So it's yeah, so they're they're really um they're really busy having like numerous bro uh, broods a year which is when you think about it, you know, in one summer, you were only talking from, let's say, April through to, through to maybe September. Um, and in that time, they get three broods in there. Um, and that's incredible, really, the speed at which uh, the, the broods turn around. I don't think there's any butterfly, any other butterfly in Britain that has as many broods, I don't think, not that I can think of, maybe small copper, perhaps. But yeah, it's, it's certainly up there with the most broods in the year. Okay, next butterfly, marsh fritillary. So again, you've got that marsh in the name, which would suggest that you find it in marshy habitats. Um, and this is uh, an interesting butterfly because it is a specialist. You don't find it everywhere, um, but you can find it in two distinct habitats. So it's found on chalk grassland, such as Morgan's Hill, but it's also found in damp grassland, uh, such as um, sort of neutral meadows that are found in river valleys and that type of thing. And the reason that it does um, use a couple of different habitats is because of the food plant, which is Devil's Bit Scabious. So Devil's Bit Scabious is found um, on chalk grassland and in damp grassland, so therefore, this butterfly is found in both of those places. Again, it's another one that's massively declined since the 1970s. There's not many colonies in damp grassland left anymore. Um, and the ones that we do have are quite um, isolated and don't really have uh, anywhere to sort of go. So th those colonies are becoming smaller and smaller and are at real risk of dying out. But I think this is one of the, one of the species which potentially um, may, there might be some benefit to this species from, from work that is done across the Marden Valley, because there is towards Chittenham in the Marden Valley, there are damp grasslands where Devil's Bit Scabious is found. So potentially, if the right work can be done in the right places, there might be potential 
to for um, this butterfly to move out from the chalk grassland sites at the head of the Marden Valley and move up the valley to other areas and other sort of damp grassland areas. I think that's that's maybe one for the future, but I think that uh, this is one of the reasons why I brought it up now, because I think there's definite potential there um, across the Marden Valley to do some work for the marsh fertility, and that would be a really great thing. I think uh, at the bottom I've mentioned metapopulation. So what that means is that the, the, it's, the marsh fertility has this sort of habit of the colonies seem to pop up in one area um, and they're found in that area for a while, maybe years, and then they tend to die back in that one area, but they will pop up again in another area, which is fairly close. So this happens all the time um, at Morgan's Hill. There's another site next door, Cheryl Down, which has a big population of marsh fritillaries. And I think that the, the population of marsh fritillaries at Morgan's Hill is part of the meta population at Cheryl Down. So at times the Morgan's Hill population will fluctuate quite a lot and it will go down quite low, almost to the point where um, they're not at that site anymore. And then slowly they'll just they'll pop back up and they'll and they'll increase in numbers again. And that is that's a part of the marsh fritillary um, ecology. And at times they can even pop up in different places a bit further away. So that's another reason why potentially I think there might be some um, uh, you know there's there's some positives in looking at how we can extend habitat throughout the valley to help butterflies like marsh fritillary find new habitat, move to other places, colonize other places. Um, and it would be, it's really important for the marsh fertility because it, it has declined massively since the seventies. Okay, third one. This is just like an amazing looking butterfly. Adonis blue. There's a, there's a number of blue butterflies um, at Morgan's Hill, common blue, chalk hill blue, but nothing compares to the Adonis blue. I'm not even sure that there's anything that compares to the colour of the Adonis blue in any species in Britain. It is amazing. The, the, the colour of the male Adonis blue, it's like, it is, it's amazing electric blue. And that photo doesn't even do it justice. It is, when you see a male um, Adonis blue flying around, you can't mistake it because the color is just so vivid. It is just unbelievable. Um, people have said to me before, oh, I saw this blue butterfly, wasn't sure if it was a common blue or whether it was an Adonis blue. Um, and I said, well, just because you're saying it to me, I'm telling you it's a common blue because you cannot mistake this amazing electric blue. Um, and you can, it's just incredible. I mean, look at it. And like I said, that photo doesn't even do it justice. Uh, it, it's rare to see a colour of such like vividness in, in the natural world. But that, there it is, the Donis Blue, and we find it at Morgan's Hill. So in comparison, uh, on the right there, you've got a female um, Adonis Blue. And she does have a bit of a blue sheen, but essentially she's more of a brown with like orange spots. And that happens a lot with the with the blue butterflies. Generally speaking, um, with the blue butterflies, only the male is really blue. The female tends to be brown. Um, so some butterflies, the male and female are fairly indistinguishable. Um, and in others, it's blatantly obvious which is a male and which is a female. And this is this is one of those obvious ones where you, you can't fail to tell the difference between the Adonis blue male and the Adonis blue female. Um, Another one that uses horseshoe vetch. Uh, oh yeah, I did put it at the top there. Yeah, so the food plant is horseshoe vetch. So again, it's it's only found where horseshoe vetch grows, which generally means the chalk hills. Okay, so most of the butterflies I've talked about so far, um, they like a uh, fairly short turf where there's lots of wildflowers, they get plenty, plenty of sun. Um, and those are conditions that you find in abundance at Morgan's Hill. Um, you know, the grass is kept nice and short, especially for butterflies like the Adonis Blue. That's exactly what they love. But there's also several butterflies 
that don't really like that. They like more scrubby grassland, uh, you know, areas of hawthorn, bramble, that type of thing, longer grass. Uh, green hair streak is one of those butterflies. It's associated with scrub habitats. Um, it is present in Morgan's Hill. And it, it causes us a problem. Um, there's also the, the I think, um, another butterfly coming up. I'll get to that in a bit, which uh, they like these habitats, which are essentially different from the majority of butterflies that live on chalk grassland. So it causes us quite a problem because if we manage the habitat for certain species, then you end up with a habitat that isn't great for other species. So what's happened in the past, and it has actually probably um, contributed to the decline of certain butterflies, probably green, green hair streak included, where um, managers of chalk grassland have, have got this uh, amazing short turf with loads of wildflowers, all the rest of it, which is good for certain things, but for, 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 for species like the green hair streak, it's not so good and they've ended up declining. So the way that we get around it is that we manage the reserve as a whole, um, but what we try and do is create what we call a matrix of habitats. So we're not looking for really short grass all across the reserve. We're looking for some areas of short grass, some areas of long grass, some areas of scrub, some areas of trees, uh, little bits of everything, and that's all mixed up. So, and then that way, what we're trying to do is provide the best of both worlds. We're trying to provide habitat that um, is, is the best we can make it for the biggest um, amount of species possible. It's not easy, but it's better to do that than it is to potentially um, manage a reserve for a specific species at the um in, in a way that's not beneficial for certain others so yeah the green hair streak is one of them it's it's the only butterfly in britain which is truly green there are other butterflies with bits of green on it but the green hair streak is green underneath completely and you only ever see it when it's when it's landed it always has its wings shut so you always see um the green under wing when it's flying, um, or, well, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a, uh, a green hair streak with its wings open, um, but if you do see one with its wings open, they're actually brown on the top, they're not green at all. And you can sort of see little bits of brown here. Um, and they, they are this incredible, like emerald green, uh, but on the top surface, they're, they're brown. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a, Again, they're a spring butterfly and they're one of uh, our earliest butterflies. We see them in April sometimes and they're really hardy. Only a tiny little thing, tiny little butterfly. Um, not the smallest butterfly in England. That's um, the small blue, but it is, it is a small butterfly and they're really hardy. I've been at Morgan's Hill before, pretty much stood just in here where uh, the, in this top photo. I was stood in there in, I think, late April, and there was a, it was nice and sunny, but there was actually a frost on the ground. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to see any butterflies today. It's just too frosty. Looked down and there was a green hair streak flying around my feet and it, in the frost. So, yeah, we, surprisingly, our spring butterflies are quite hardy and they can cope with the, with the conditions that we have in England you know, as we're just coming out of winter, which is quite surprising really. But then when you think about it, you know, they've been living in, in, in these conditions for thousands of years uh, since, you know, whenever they moved moved here from the, in, at the end of the ice age. So yeah, it's not surprising really that they can cope with more than what you think. These tiny little delicate butterflies are actually reasonably hardy in cases. So, okay. So, this is the last butterfly we're, we're going to look at, the Duke of Burgundy. And it is without a doubt my favorite butterfly ever. Um, there's so much to talk about. It's just the most incredible 
butterfly. So it is a much declined butterfly from this, let's say the seventies. Um, but it is one that is a conservation success, actually. It's the numbers in the seventies, uh, you know, they plummeted. Uh, it was 80, 86%, maybe something like that, that the numbers have dropped uh, between the 1970s and the 1990s. But since then, conservation organizations across the country have been putting in a lot of work to conserve this butterfly, us included. And it is actually a conservation success. It's on the increase now. It's doing a lot better than it was. Um, and yeah, it's a success and I'm really pleased because it's such a characterful butterfly. So originally, uh, it's always been a specialist butterfly, but originally, and I don't know when, when I say originally, I'm not exactly sure when I'm talking about, but certainly before my time, probably somewhere in the last hundred years, I don't know exactly. Um, originally, this was a woodland butterfly. It lived in uh, coppice woodland, areas of woodland that was cut down and, and light reached the, the woodland floor. And that was the type of area that it liked. But over the last hundred years, coppice woodland is something that's it's, it, coppicing trees has gone into a massive decline as well. People don't really do it that much anymore. So therefore, the habitat of the Duke of Burgundy basically dried up, disappeared. But at some point, like I say, maybe within the last hundred years, I'm not exactly sure. At some point, the Duke of Burgundy decided that actually it's going to have to do something because all the habitats disappearing and it moved. It, they, it moved from woodland and now it lives in scrubby chalk grassland. Um, so across England, it's really difficult to find a woodland colony of uh, Duke of Burgundy's anymore. Most of them uh, are now colonies on chalk grassland. So it, this butterfly has adapted to what's going on around it environmentally and it's changed its habitat. It's still a specialist, um, but at least it's, it's, you know, it's been able to adapt. It was able to adapt and move um, and that, in a way sort of contributed to, to, to the success as well. So it's, it's a specialist in, in the fact that its sole food plant is cow slips. In um, the woodland habitat, it used primroses, but in the, in the chalk grassland habitat, it only uses cow slips. The female butterfly will only lay eggs on cow slips and it will only lay eggs on cow slips that are of a, the correct size in the correct position in, in an, either a north or a west facing grassland, which Morgan's Hill is. Um, and the reason it does that is because it uses the cow slips that are protected from the sun as we get through to the summer. So if, if, it, if it laid its eggs on a cow slip that was on a south facing bit of grassland, the cow slip would shrivel up, shrivel up in the sun. Um, and die, and then the egg would probably get destroyed with it. So that's so it uses plants that are sufficiently shaded and in a nice spot that the, the cow slip will last through the year, and then that's what's used for the as, as the egg hatches into the larvae and the larvae eats the leaves, um, and then eventually go drops down into the grass um, and pupates into the adult the following year. And that's the only food plant they use is cowslips. So there's, in North Wiltshire, there's only a very few number of colonies of Duke of Burgundy. There was three, um, Morgan Hill being one of them. There's now four or even five, I'm not entirely sure. It's all kept a bit hush-hush because that was, um, it, it, it was quite precarious and still is really for the Duke of Burgundy in North Wiltshire. Uh, but I know for sure at least one more colony has been found uh, somewhere over near Marlborough, I believe. Um, and yeah, it was, it's one of those butterflies that there, there, there have been difficulties in conservation because this, it, it took a long time to actually work out 
why and how the butterfly was moving from you know one habitat to another and why and how it was using the food plant um, in the way that it was so once people once it was worked out that actually they were using certain cowslips in certain conditions uh, and once you know that you can then conserve the butterfly itself um, i think as you're thinking about the, the actual creature itself um, you can't really tell the difference just by looking at a butterfly the difference between the male and the female um, well there's a couple of things you can do the first is if you look at this photo here you can see that this butterfly here only has two sets of legs rather than three so if you see a duke of burgundy with two sets of legs you know that's a male because the female has three sets of legs the male has three sets of legs but its front set of legs up here a little stunted versions that you can't see so you can only see two sets of legs i don't know why that is but it is common through uh all the butterflies all the butterfly species in the duke of burgundy's family this is the only one found in britain but there's there's lots of others in south america and in the male they all have this two leg two two sets of legs configuration rather than three don't know why it is it's just the way it is the other way you can tell the difference between the male and the female is that they actually have completely different characters. You can tell a male Duke of Burgundy butterfly from a female Duke of Burgundy butterfly by the way it's acting. I know it sounds odd, but you can. They don't, they act completely differently. So, and also in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the male, he acts really stereotypically as well. So the female spends most of her time crawling through grass. It doesn't fly very much. Um, it will mate with the, with the males and then it will lay its eggs on the cowslips. And generally, um, you don't really see the males, uh, the females too much. The male is completely different. So he's a bit of a thug uh, and basically, all he does in his entire life um, is fight and have sex. Basically, that's all he does. He doesn't even eat. So this one butterfly, this male, will last maybe two weeks. That's it. As another adult butterfly, two weeks max, maybe even a little bit less. So what he does is, as you see some butterflies nectaring on flowers, Duke of Burgundy doesn't bother. Is you know that the, the time it's alive, it, it does nectar on, on on flowers occasionally, but generally speaking, doesn't even bother nectaring on flowers. All it does is recreate the species, and that's it. So it sits on a leaf. In this case, I'm not sure what leaf it is. It is sat on, but generally speaking, you'll see a Duke of Burgundy sat on a leaf, and it will sit there. And every now and again, if another butterfly comes by, it will fly out check out see what's going on if it's a if it's a female duke of burgundy they'll mate if it's not a female duke of burgundy if it's different but a fly whatever a fly it'll beat it up a bit push it out of its territory and then once it's done that it will come back and land on exactly the same leaf again and basically that's all it ever does each individual male will just sit on its leaf and buzz out beat things up and then uh, reproduce if it gets the chance. So it's basically a stereotypical thug. Um, and it's just unbelievable. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen male Duke of Burgundies sat on, uh, let's say, uh, a, a nettle leaf, and I watch it for maybe an hour, and it buzz about fighting with things. Um, it's not often you see uh, any reproduction going on. I've probably seen it once, maybe, in all the time I've been at Morgan Sill. Hardly ever see it. You don't often see the females. But yeah, you can watch a male um, for an hour and all it does is buzz about landing on its leaf. And then I can go off, come back three days later, still sat there on the same leaf. And it, yeah, that's all it does. And so you know categorically that it's a male, even without looking at the legs, because it's just sat there on its spot, checking out its territory, 
doing what males do basically so yeah it's just they they never cease to amaze me it's just like how you wouldn't think that butterflies could have a character um but some of them do and the, the duke of burgundy is one of them and it's is such a characterful butterfly and it was in such um such decline it was in a real bad place uh like i say there's only three there was originally only three colonies in north wiltshire south wiltshire is a bit better off there's a there's a lot more colonies in south wiltshire south wiltshire is one of the strongholds of the duke of burgundy across the country um but things are looking up you know it, 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 a lot of conservation work has been done um i think you know the duke of burgundy is not a species that you're going to see throughout the entire Marden Valley, but it is one that potentially could, with the right work, move across the chalk hills. So that's what we're looking at as, as a trust. We're trying to work with our neighbours, um, uh, the farmers in, in our area, the golf course, which is next door, uh, various other people. And we're, what we're trying to do is create more habitat, create that connectivity of different areas of scrubby grassland and hopefully we can create the right conditions to help this butterfly thrive and then in the years to come maybe we'll you know have even more colonies in North Wiltshire we shall see um, but yeah it's it's going in the right direction so I think that's yeah that's the last of the species I'm going to look at there's just a couple more slides now um, so what I, I want to look at here is one of the things that people can do um, to help butterflies, wherever you might be, you know, across the Martin Valley, wherever that is. So the uh, Butterfly Conservation, which is a great organization that, um, that works like tirelessly to conserve butterflies across the country. Every year they hold their big butterfly count. So you can look down at the bottom there. It says from 16th of July to the 8th of August, pretty much every year, big butterfly count is on. And I think it's really important for everybody to get involved. You can do the big butterfly count wherever you are, in your garden, in a park, wherever. Um, but it's important that we, uh, Butterfly Conservation, Wiltshire Wildlife Trust, whoever it might be, uh, conservation organizations across the country you know it's really important to know what butterflies are where what numbers of them are there you know are they increasing are they declining which are the ones that really need the help you know and that can't be done unless everybody takes part and you know does the big butterfly count and puts numbers in so i think that yeah i can't stress that enough it's really it's really important that if you if you don't know what you've got if you don't know the numbers of what's there you can't do anything about you know you can't try and increase things if you don't know what's there in the first place so yeah big butterfly count uh butterfly conservation really important if if you do one thing or if you only want to do one thing do a big butterfly count it takes 15 minutes really easy you can go online google the big butterfly count get a, a, a chart which you can tick off what you see that type of thing um you only need to do it in your garden so it's all the common garden species like you know small tortoiseshell peacock that type of thing um really easy really fun yeah the more people the merrier and yeah following on from that on saturday the 24th of july i think uh nikki mentioned it earlier that avonese trees are holding a big butterfly count at hazeland um, so yeah, I don't know whether, uh, Susan or somebody wants to say a little bit more about it later, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a really good event. Get down there, get involved. See, yeah, Nikki was mentioning how, uh, there was butterflies all across the meadows and stuff. So it should be a really good day. So if you fancy sort of going out and doing a big butterfly count on a really nice site then pop over to Hazeland and, um, get it done there or pop over to Hazeland and then go back home and do it in the garden as well. So yeah, the more the more the merrier, for sure. So that's pretty much it, really. I think if anybody wants to ask any questions, they can do. Oh, I see there's some in the chat already. Yeah, I didn't see them pop up. But um, yeah, so in terms of the Wiltshire Wildlife Trust, uh, you can go on our website and have a look at um, how you can get involved on at Morgan's Hill or various other reserves. 
there's like uh, a what's on thing which shows we've got uh, events, talks, walks, all that type of thing. Um, and there's volunteering on most of the reserves. I don't have a volunteer group at Morgan's Hill at the moment, but I'm hoping to get one back underway for the autumn. So that's something to look out for. And so if anyone wants to contact me, there's my email address down here on the left. And then on the right is my wild landscapes email. If anybody wants any help with um, improving their green space, yeah, just drop me a line. And I think that's pretty much it. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, I've got loads of questions. I'm sure others will have too, but that's absolutely brilliant. And okay. yes, just to, just to repeat that um, if you want to come and please do come to the Big Butterfly Count at Hazeland, just look on our website, uh, on the Avon Needs Trees website and you're under events and you'll see where to register. So uh, yeah, we definitely hope to see you there um, and all help very, very welcome. Um, Nick, I have to ask that question I began at the beginning. How, are the, how does the heat affect our butterflies? Um, so in different ways, actually. Uh, some of them, it, when it gets really hot, they become less active and some become more active. I think that in general, um, heat isn't too bad for, for the adult butterfly itself. It can become a problem if we go through a sustained period of, um, of heat, but not that it affects the butterfly so much as it affects the food plants. So we might have, let's say for instance, um, a common blue butterfly lays its eggs on bird's foot trefoil. If we, we have a sort of drought period and the bird foot trefoil or uh, shrivels up and dies, then generally it take the eggs with it. So I think, it doesn't affect the the adults so much as it affects the food plants and that can be the problem i think yeah okay okay and i did hear that one of the important things that people often forget is to actually leave out water for butterflies is that is that true yeah i mean i think as with all species i think you know like i think um uh the guy in the last uh uh zoom mentioned about you know like putting out um sort of like uh, like sugar water and stuff for bees and what have you or you know people have heard of that and I think in in terms of butterflies um I, it's not it's not a necessity but I think it all helps I, it's not just going to help butterflies it's going to help everything I think in, in, when we're in periods like this um I don't think we have to worry too much about the butterflies because they they get their salts and stuff um from by from various means um from even down to sort of like, uh, you know, dog feces or anything like that. They can get salts from quite a lot of, uh, and sometimes some, so a butterfly will land on you and it's getting salt from the sweat. Um, so I don't think it's, it's, it's crucial to get out water specifically for butterflies, but I think in weather like this, it's definitely crucial to get out water for wildlife in general is a really good thing. Okay. All right. We've got one question in the chat from Helena. Um, just asking why was the Duke of Burgundy named the Duke of Burgundy? Was it because of how it was discovered or because of its behavior? So no one actually knows. I, I, I mean, like I said, there was so much I could say about this butterfly and there's only a certain amount of time and it's just whatever comes out my head really. But um, nobody actually knows why it's called Duke of Burgundy. Originally, uh, and when I say originally, I think I'm talking about the 1800s. It was actually called um, I've got to remember this now because I'm terrible with people's names. It was called, um, I've forgotten the guy's name, but anyway, it was, uh, it was called uh, somebody, oh, what was it? Um, it had a different name anyway, and it was called uh, this person's name, Small Fertillery. So the, it, was, it was the name of the person that originally discovered it uh in whatever it was 1700 and something um uh oh was it miss mr uh Don't worry, we can it's, all get it on it's, it's, I, I remembered it i remembered it, it it's mr vernon's small fertility and that that was its original name mr vernon's small fertility then somewhere along the line the name changed but nobody really knows who changed it or why so there's no record of who called it the Duke of Burgundy. So it's, it's ended up with this name, which is quite, um, 
apt i feel i don't know i just feel like you know it's sort of like yeah the the, the duke of burgundy like sort of like you know flying around its territory um but yeah nobody actually knows why or even who called it that it was just one of those things that happened somewhere along the line <laughs> yeah well i'm fascinating to know that there's this sort of gender difference it, i don't think anyone most of us yeah. wouldn't have uh, thought that, that that existed between in uh, butterflies yeah. and like you know before um before i got involved at morgan's hill you know I remember the the warden before me saying to me, "Yeah, you won't believe it. It's got its character. It flies around beating things up." And like, I was like, "Yeah, okay." But then, you know, the first time I ever saw one, it is actually true. It's a butterfly with a character, and it's just amazing. And you can you cannot fail to to know whether it's male or female by the way it's acting. And it's just yeah, yeah one of those incredible things. Yeah. Okay. Um. Can I just ask also, well, if anybody wants to post any more questions in the chat room, please do, or, or put your hand up and let us know that you want to ask a question. And um, in the meantime, Nick, can I just ask you about whether, um, particularly with the um, Devil's Bit Scabious, should we be encouraging this further down? Would it help the marsh fritillary, fritillary and others if we helped locate that plant further down at Hazeland and other parts of the Marden Valley? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's... Um... There's, there's a couple of sites I know of already that does have um, uh, Devil's Bit Scabious. And I, I think that, yeah, there would be, it, it can't hurt um, to encourage Devil's Bit Scabious, even if it was a case of like in certain areas, such as the meadow area at um, uh, Hazeland, plant in some plug plants of Devil's Bit Scabious. It may never come to anything. You know, we may never get marsh fertilities that far down the valley, but I don't think it can hurt to try. And it certainly is, uh, it's, been, it's a beneficial plant anyway. It's gonna help insects, even if you don't get the marsh artillery. So I don't, I think that's a really good point actually. And I, yeah, I think that it's, uh, there's no downside to, to giving it a try. Yeah, absolutely. Good, 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 good. Okay, I think um, Mike Birkin's got a question. Mike, do you wanna unmute? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nick. That was a, a lovely talk. It's great to hear so much kind of, oh, engagement with the personality of butterflies rather than just sort of dry scientific stuff about them. It was wonderful. Um, I, I was just amazed. I had no idea that Morgan's Hill was such a special site. And uh, yeah, like you say, there must be very few other places, if there are any in, in Britain, where you get 37 different species. And I, I just wondered if you've got any sort of insight as to why Morgan's Hill should have that special thing about it that nowhere else has got so many butterflies as Morgan's Hill does. Well, I think, um, well, thanks to start with, for, um, yeah, for what you were saying about, uh, yeah, you know, talking about sort of trying to steer away from the science stuff and just talk about, you know, the, the uh, you know, the more characterful stuff. And that's what I try to do. I think, you know, you can, you can baffle people with a lot of science, but I think, yeah, I, I like to try and sort of like, you know, extend my passion of like, you know, what I see and what I, what I do. And I, I think that's just a much better way of doing it and just trying to engage with people on that level. So, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think I, I think that I, I, I wouldn't try to suggest that Morgan's Hill is the only place that has 37 species, because I think that all across the chalk grassland within Wiltshire, there probably are sites with the same number of species. So it's not, I don't think, I mean, there wouldn't be many, but I think there would be, there would be more within Wiltshire anyway. But I think it's a combination of a lot of, lot of different, um, it's one of those sort of like ecological, it's almost like, well, we, we, we do refer it to it sometimes as a happy accident. It's, you know, sometimes, the stars align and the, 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 con, the right conditions are there in a certain place for that number of species to exist in that area. Um, you know, it's, it's unusual to find um, an area of chalk grassland on a north and west facing slope with areas that are scrubby, but also areas that are, uh, are, are sh you know, shorter. Um, and it's just one of those things. You can even, let's say, move over to Cheryl Dam, which is a quarter of a mile away. It's still a really special site for butterflies, um, but it has different types of butterflies. For example, 
uh, at Cheryl Down, they don't have the Duke of Burgundy because they don't really have those scrubby north facing slopes, but they do have some really lovely south facing slopes and the numbers of butterflies such as marsh fritillaries they get is immense. Adonis blues, absolutely loads. And another one would be small blue. They, they get really big numbers of certain butterflies that do really well on their site. And I think every site is slightly different. You know, there's slightly different aspect, slightly different, uh, you know, slope. There's, there's differences in the other species that are there, like ants and the other invertebrates, you know? There's, and then sometimes you get a site like Morgan Seal where everything just comes together for that specialness, you know? And it, it is one of those places, it's just, um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's, it's a miracle, really, you know, how the, how things like that even do come about. But, you know, you, you do get them. They're, they're there. Um, and that's why they're so special. And that's why we really got to look after them, because once they're gone, they're gone. They're not coming back. So, yeah, it's important. We do look after them. OK, we, we better wrap up in a minute, um, Nick. I just want to ask one more question, because we're all getting used to the idea that we need to leave our grass to grow longer and, um, you know, just cut it infrequently, perhaps just once a year, maybe twice a year and so on. But I'm just I've never quite understood. Maybe I'm missing something for, for the species that are laying their eggs and long grass over winter and so on. Surely, you know, we may have seen the butterflies through the summer and whatever, but are we not? Just are we whenever we cut, are we not destroying that habitat for the egg laying and and, and the um, hibernation period? So potentially, yes. But I think that's that's why uh, I talked about this sort of matrix of habitats. I don't think that um, that we you know uh, that you should be cut in a specific area completely the same level all the way across it. You know, if you've got a field, let's say, you, you should always leave some areas uncut. And so hopefully those are the areas that the butterflies will use. You know, it, it's like if, if you're if you're cutting a meadow, cut half of it, cut another half, you know, later on in the year. It, you, sh you should never be just blanket cutting everything all in one go. You know, I, th I think it's, it's important to make sure that you've got enough habitat of all different types that you that you can still encourage um the, the, the you know the most species you can but also what you've got to remember in terms of grassland management is that these butterflies uh not just butterflies but any any insect really they've adapted to living in those conditions so they're perfectly adapted to cope with cutting with grazing that type of thing for instance um you know so, so some of these butterflies that that do lay their eggs on uh grass they might not necessarily be laying it, uh, laying the eggs high up on the grass stems. They're probably laying them right down in the sort of clumpy bit at the bottom where they're protected, even from probably like a, you know, a sheep stepping on it. So when, when it, when it does get grazed or when it does get cut, those eggs are not destroyed. And over, you know, over however many thousands of years, they've adapted to our agriculture essentially so yeah it, i it's i think it's a it's a, a valid concern um but i think when, when you when you really stop and look at what's actually going on and you realize that the the species not just at morgan's hill but across grassland they've adapted even the plants have adapted to live in grassland so they grow from what we call a basal rosette so that when when they get cut they can still grow again from the bottom they, you know, in, so they, they've adapted over time um, to, uh, you know, to be, to be able to cope with those conditions. So valid point, but yeah, it's adaption basically. Okay. All right. I think we're probably, probably at the end there, but I want to thank you for a really, really fascinating talk. And actually just to say, from what I remember, Nick, we had, Last year we recorded 18 different species at Hazen, is that right? Yeah, I, something like that, yeah. Which yes, is, yes. Yeah, that's so really we, good. Yeah. yeah, so we've got way to go to meet, reach Morgan Hill standards, but uh, but 18 isn't bad, is it? And that was no, no, not bad at all. I think that, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bunch of generalist butterflies which you can find pretty much anywhere. And there's probably, mm. you know, maybe let's say a dozen of those. Um, but you're also starting to see 
actual woodland butterflies at Hazeland. And I think in the future, um, as more work is done at Hazeland and more areas are coppiced and opened up, that number is only going to increase. There's, there's certainly uh, other woodland butterflies that could potentially colonize Hazeland in the future. So it's all looking bright. Yeah, and 18 is a great number, you know, and it's and you could build on that too. So yeah, it's there's, yeah. there's, there's really positive. Okay, great, good, good, good. Okay, well, I think it's getting on and uh, the evening's cooling down. So we're all rushing to get out, I guess. So thank you so much, Nick, really, really appreciate it. Thanks again to Robert, Friends of the Marden Valley for helping us host this and to Susan for organizing it. And thanks to everybody for attending. And we hope to see you at Hazeland on Saturday. Okay, thanks very much. And we'll see you again in October. Okay, thank you, Bye. it was a pleasure. Thanks, Nick.